Hi everybody, I'm Scott, and in this video I want to talk about a slight misconception regarding electrical service in the United States. I watch a lot of YouTube videos about vintage and modern tech, both by people here in the US and abroad. When talking about powering those devices, the consensus seems to be that in the States we have a 120 volt electrical system, with 220 to 240 volts in Europe and 100 volts in Japan, just to name a few. So it might surprise you to know that standard electrical service here in the US is 240 volts, not 120. Well, or rather, not just 120. And in actuality, it's more like somewhere between 220 and 250 volts, and 110 and 125 volts, respectively. Though I'm sure many people here already know this, I figured this subject might be of particular interest to people in other parts of the world. So, let me show you my electrical service. In my area, we obviously have overhead power lines, which I'd say represents the majority of local delivery systems here in America. Many neighborhoods do have underground wiring, though, but you'll usually find those in warmer climates such as Florida or California. Underground wiring doesn't play nicely with the freeze-thaw cycles here in New York, where temperatures can go anywhere from negative 10 to 110 degrees Fahrenheit, which is negative 23 to 43 degrees centigrade. Yes, there are buried power lines in my area too, but they're definitely not typical, and generally speaking, maintaining them is far more expensive than overhead distribution, and far more disruptive as it would require digging up a street rather than simply bringing a bucket truck. Here's what you're looking at. At the top is the primary distribution circuit, and those can operate at a wide variety of voltages. I can't measure mine for obvious reasons, but anywhere from 2 kilovolts to 14 kilovolts is probable. As you can see, there's only one wire supplying us with power. The system voltage is referenced to ground, so the actual earth is effectively the return conductor on the circuit, and that's a pretty common arrangement the world over. The primary line connects to this pole-mounted transformer, which steps the voltage down to something that's usable in the home, namely 240 volts. This transformer is shared by various houses in the neighborhood, with the 240 volt secondary run along here, to the right of the transformer. It's then tapped anywhere a house needs service. My house appears to tap power directly adjacent to the transformer, but this cable actually originates a few houses down that way. My service drop runs from that tap point over my yard and into a weather head, and then down this conduit to our meter. The wiring continues on from the meter to what's commonly called the service panel, breaker box, or circuit breaker panel. I feel like the breaker panel should be a topic for its own video, and though there are a wide variety of brands and models here in the US, this is undoubtedly the most common in general appearance, at least for post-1960ish homes that have a 200 amp service, which is the common amperage for service to most detached homes. For this video, the important thing to note is this switch at the top. That's the main breaker that can cut power to all the other circuits in the panel. And with the cover off, you can see two connections running into that breaker. Those are the wires coming from the meter outside. So if you didn't believe me when I said that most homes in the US are fed at 240 volts, here's the proof. Okay, I'm being a bit sneaky by repeatedly mentioning that 240 volts is our standard household voltage. While that is indeed the voltage being supplied by the transformer, the vast majority of electrical outlets in the American home supply power at 120 volts, as is well known. So what's going on? Well, I purposefully forgot to mention the neutral wire. Because of the way the transformer behind my house is oriented, you can't see the connection points for the low voltage side, but this is pretty much the same type of unit here, and you'll see that there are three secondary connections. Those are generally referred to as L1, N, and L2, for line 1, neutral, and line 2. L1 and L2 are both live, also sometimes called hot, conductors, while N is a grounded conductor. L1 and L2 are out of phase with each other by 180 degrees, meaning their waveforms look like this. The RMS, which is root mean square, difference, the way AC voltage is typically measured, between these two waveforms is 240 volts. However, the difference between L1 and N is 120 volts RMS, as is the difference between L2 and N. Let's take a look at this much smaller AC transformer that's rated for 120 volt primary and a 12 volt secondary. In other words, it's a step down transformer for operating 12 volt equipment such as relays or lights. On the primary side, it has two connections, one for live and one for neutral. This is just like the transformer behind my house, where the live conductor is operating at multiple kilovolts, and the neutral is quite literally the ground beneath it. On the output side, there are three connections, just like its bigger brother. We could call them L1, N, and L2 for the sake of analogy. So, let me connect this to a supply voltage and do some probing. Again, like a scaled down version of its bigger brother, the outer two terminals measure 12 volts relative to each other. If I measure from either of the outer two lugs to the center lug, it's 6 volts, or half of 12. The oscilloscope also shows that, just like the 240 volts coming into my house, 
there are two sine waves that are 180 degrees out of phase with each other when measuring 12 volts in the outer two connections. From either of those connections to the center tap, there's only a single sine wave. And also like the primary side of the transformer outside, this transformer only has a single phase, this time at 120 volts, relative to neutral or ground. Now, as much as I'd love to disassemble this transformer, I kind of need it, so let me show you a diagram of what's going on here. A transformer like this consists of two coils of wire wound around a common core. A difference in voltage between one side of the transformer and the other is created by varying the number of times the wire is physically wound around the core on both sides. The ratio of turns on one side versus the other is the same as the ratio of voltage on one side versus the other. So if both sides had exactly the same number of turns, the input and output voltage will be exactly the same. If one side has twice as many turns as the other, that side will have twice the voltage as the other side. This transformer, to step down 120 volts to 12 volts, would have 10 times as many turns on the 120 volt side as the 12 volt side. So, just for the sake of example, let's say there are 1000 turns on the 120 volt side, and 100 on the 12 volt side. Now what if we took a wire and soldered it right here, and then measured the voltage between these two points? Well, in the space between those two connections, there are 50 turns. The ratio is then 50 to 1000, and so the voltage will be 20 times lower than the voltage here. Hence, when I supply the transformer with 120 volts, you can see 6 volts. And this is inherently bidirectional in principle. I could feed 12 volts into this transformer here, and measure 120 volts here. In other words, a simple transformer like this can be used to either step up or step down voltage. In fact, it's the same for the transformer on the pole. I should also note that in the real world, transformers are not nearly as simple as I'm making them sound, but the general idea is correct. And that's how residential electrical supply in the US works. Well, pretty much. And it's called a split phase system because the single phase coming from the distribution grid is effectively split into two by the center tap in the transformer. The upshot of all of this is that I have both 120 volt and 240 volt outlets in my home, as with most houses. 240 volts is widely used, but mainly for large permanently installed equipment like hot water heaters, air conditioners, clothes dryers, stoves, ovens, hot tubs, electric car charging, and even whole house heating basically any situation where a lot of power is required. However, you can call an electrician and have them wire a 240 volt outlet anywhere you might need it. The only sticking point is that if you're looking to run, for example, vintage European 240 volt computers, they may or may not be compatible with our 60 hertz system. And that being said, for equipment that solely uses DC voltage internally, the capacitors on the low voltage side would probably have an easier job of maintaining charge at a higher frequency. I think it's potentially more problematic the other way around, using equipment rated for 60 hertz on 50 hertz systems. But obviously don't take my word for it, double check that for your particular device before applying power. So I hope you found that interesting. Split phase power has its advantages and disadvantages, and of course there's a lot more to it than what I've outlined in this video. But the main advantage for me personally is that I can operate random 240 volt electronics at home, as well as the usual American 120 volt stuff. In fact, most of the UPSs and servers here in my basement are running at 240 volts. Now, I'm getting off on a tangent here, but you may have noticed that this is decidedly not a smart meter, and though it's a pretty old school design, they are still quite common here in the States. It does actually require a person to come and read it manually. Well, that's it for now. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe and do the liking thing and all the other regular YouTube outro stuff. You can also examine my website at s.co.tt, which is totally a real URL. I promise. I tried whenever possible to make it clear that I was talking about the most common way in which power is delivered to an American home, and there are exceptions of course. For example, if you live in an apartment in the US, your building may be fed by three-phase power, which is quite standard for commercial and industrial properties. In that case, you, as the tenant, will most likely only have access to 120 volt circuits, and there probably won't be any 240 volt circuits available anyway. Even if your building is fed by split phase power, your landlord might not have a need to supply your apartment with any 240 volt circuits. Power delivery in rural areas can be a little weird, so for all I know there might be single phase 120 volt systems out there. And finally, some older homes may still have single phase 120 volt distribution panels, which are probably fuse boxes, even in neighborhoods where split phase power is otherwise in place. Now also, this video is intended as a general interest thing, and so don't take my word as absolute gospel on any of these issues. I don't have the capacity to bestow any magical powers of electrical licensing on any of you. Sorry.